Okay, so my subject is Grandma Moses, and my main argument here is that she's a history, history painting, history painter. And this is contrary to um, classical canonical categorizations of her work um, as a memory painter uh, or memory painting. So my main structure of my argument is to argue that basically that her work is too distanced um, to be memory painting. And I think there's an implication in memory painting that there's a really there's a really high degree of intimacy. It, um, it is not replicated in her work. Um, and that this distance then aligns her better with history painting. Um, and I'll get into the details of that argument. Um, and the main way that this shakes out is in two branches. So first I want to separate her from memory painting because she is so often like the quintessential memory painter. So many definitions are built around her almost specifically. Memory painting has, is made it somewhat identical to, to Grandma Moses, which is not what I mean to talk about. I mean, I mean to talk about a memory painting that is uh, sort of rendered as a, as a living category. So I'm going to investigate some implications in um, definitions and interpretations of memory painting and use those uh, to separate her from memory painting. Um, and then my second strand of my argument is going to be on making history painting a viable alternative category for her to fit into. So first I want to talk a little bit about, you know, before I go into the details of that argument, I want to give a kind of a classical interpretation of her work. So, you know, standard in, in standard in a standard view, what is what is her work of? You know, these are landscapes of rural living, um, suggesting sort of a nostalgic past. Uh, and part of her claim here is that these are her memories. So she was born in 1860. She lived to around 1960. Uh, rough times. Um, and so she's making a claim to, you know, why these are memory paintings is because she's painting her personal remembrances, recollections of this rural living. She lived on a farm for most of her life, or almost all of her life, um, in this rural environment. So she's just replicating that in her paintings. Um, and so we see, you know, tilted perspectives, um, iconic figures, a sentimentality, you know, kind of warmth. He's been compared, like her landscapes too, have been compared to like quilted, like expanses like quilts. Um, and that sort of suggests a sort of uh, warmth and embrace in her in her paintings. And that the warmth and the embrace kind of suggest the nostalgia uh, inherent in a lot of memory painting as well. So to get into the nitty gritty of what this is about, um, So I want to now turn to Roger Cardinal and his definition of memory painting um, as a key guide here. Well, I mean, he starts by defining memory painting in like these really narrow terms that is almost directly described in there. So this is this that's not the one I want to talk about. So I'm, as far as memory painting is equated with Grandma Moses, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about his interpretation of memory painting that. Um, and what it means that relies really heavily on um, his idea of memory traces and the presence of the artist. So he um, describes like the memory painter's goals as kind of reaching back into their minds and instead of directly accessing the event itself, they are painting their memories of that event. They're painting their the way that that event was recorded into their conscious mind and they're reaching back into their mind and drawing that and making that the painting. Um, and that's the memory traces. And what that means is that we're, we're brought into this really intimate conscious place with that, with the maker, um, because, you know, we're separated from the material past reality and we're given instead this conscious vision of what that memory was. And that, that, bring, that gives us that kind of intimate subjectivity that I think is implied in a lot of memory paintings definitions. And so looking at this painting of Husik Valley, and that, that's again, the presence of the maker, the presence of the maker is, uh, is part of, uh, Cardinal's interpretation. Um, so looking at this painting of Husik Valley, I think this is really evident um, in this painting because we have this device of the frame that is intended to, the frame in the window that is intended to put us in Moses' shoes. Um, and then we look out that window at this place, which is not actually visible from a window because the vantage point is so high up um, in, in this painting, like the, the perspective is so tilted that no window could perceive this whole 
scene as she's painted it. So what that means is that we are given sort of Grandma Moses' um, expanded conscious map and understanding of that space. Because she looks out of that window and she doesn't see just pedantically what is materially outside that window, but she sees, you know, what lies beyond that hill, what the way that the river turns and what lies beyond. So she sees that more expanded um, uh, map uh, as a result, result of her conscious experiences and her conscious, conscious associations, and that's what she's pre presented to us here. Um, and that's how this is bringing us into sort of an intimate contact with her uh, self. So that's Cardinal's interpretation. Um, but I want to now suggest sort of a problem there. So I think, again, I've been describing how so core to memory painting is its implications like this, this intimate interaction with the self. But I think mapping, and I described it just there at this moment, I think there's sort of a, that's, that, that, that's my end to this, to this distance. It's implied distance in her painting in a way that it doesn't quite fulfill that intimate subjectivity. Um, but I'll get to that in just a moment, the details of that, uh, back to the map. But first I want to introduce um, phenomenologist uh, Stephen Crowell. So he, I want to align the implications of memory, that kind of um, um, intimate subjectivity with Crowell's time of the eye. So that's um, the way he, he describes the time of the eye in, in contrast to a narrative self uh, which is sort of this determined understanding of the self uh, based on kind of this filtration of memory. So we filter it and then we determine it and we bring it into this coherent story and that's how we construct a determined narrative self. And this is in contrast to a like a radically first person self which is the like this the self that does the, it's almost a self that just does that constructing and but it's not possible to reflect on that self because it's so it's so in the moment, right? So it doesn't it doesn't accumulate a history. It isn't really part of chrono chronology. Um, the reflective self is the one that is historical and, and um, narrative. And the the time of the eye, that that radical in being self, um, is kind of this highly intimate. And, that, and it, it's also in that self where like the real essence of the self is found um, because there's there's a certain deadness in the determinacy of the reflected self um, and the uh, the radically of the time of the, radi the radically first person in being of the time of the eye is more living by contrast so and I think that memory memory pretty wants to access that time of the eye um, and further striking this is the kind of the implied nostalgia in so much um, memory painting that they are these that they are described as these nostalgic visions. And for Roger Cardinal, nostalgia, I mean, uh, Stephen Crowell, rather, uh, nostalgia is is a encounter with that time of the eye. It's, it's kind of an encounter with a representation of it. Um, it's an encounter with a past time of the eye, a past in being. Um, and part of the disjunction of that experience of nostalgia and kind of the yearning of it is that, you know, that, that in being self is I described how it doesn't accumulate history. It's not quite in the in 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 time, or it does like it doesn't perceive itself in time because as soon as it perceives itself, as soon as it constructs um, 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 a chronology, it's, it's constructing a narrative narrative itself. Um, and so, just for a moment in nostalgia, it, it encounters this affect of of that other in being in the past of its own self, and it's kind of yearning, but also. disquieted by that experience. Um, and so that's, 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 that's what I think the implication of memory painting is. It's about that radical first person experience. Um, but I don't think that's what Moses does. Um, and it's because, and I talked about the determinacy, I think what mapping does in the suggestion of these things as maps is it's actually suggesting a sort of determined, filtered, conscious experience. And kind of the way that these icons are rendered, I mean, these figures are kind of rendered as icons, um, everything is made hyper-legible, you know, how readability is made, for, is foregrounded so much, um, I think implies the really high level of determinacy in these paintings. So we're not getting at that in-being self, uh, we're not getting at this kind of, 
you know, if the, if the, if, if the, if the narrative by self is determined, then the in being self is not as determined. And so this is not getting at that, at that same level of accurate because of its determinacy, because of its legibility, because of its, um, narrative implications. So that we are coming into consciousness with the conscious world, that's true, we're coming kind of with her conscious, with a conscious representation, we're coming on, we're coming into, co into contact with a sort of inert consciousness um, by uh, narrativization and distancing. Okay, so I, that, that, that's, that's the main thrust of my um, argument for her separation from memory painting. Um, but that's, okay, so how, how is she history painting? So history painting, I mean, at first glance, it's not so evident how she would be history painting because history painting was kind of became this really concrete form between the 17th and 19th century, this kind of neoclassical painting where um, it's really grand style depicting historical events um, in dramatic narrative fashion um, with lots of figures, typically. It's the apex of academic painting. So how could Moses be that? Um, but I think there's a closer look at history painting reveals a greater degree of flexibility and fluidity. And just as a glimmer of hope, I want to suggest Horace Pippin as a contemporary painter who has been identified as a history painter um, in some fields. I think Roger Cardinal uh, uh, regarded him as a history painter and Stephen Kahn, another his, uh, historian, also has uh, written him as a, uh, as a history painter. So I think there's some, some like critical or literary allusions to that possibility, and um, Horace Pippin uh, gives a glimpse of how uh, history painting could be uh, more fluid. Um, but let me go into some of the details of what that looks like. So, so you know, historian Stuart Lingo uh, begins the story of uh, history painting around kind of the end of the Renaissance. This is a mannerist painter, uh, mannerist painting here, the, the, the martyrdom of San Lorenzo, but I'm using this as a example. But, um, Around, around that period, uh, Lorenzo Alberti um, first coins, or he's among one of the first who like, coined the term um, that is associated with history painting. He calls it historia um, in the Latin. And this is a history um, in the same way that we would understand it today. It's more associated with just like generalized story painting or narrative painting. Um, and it was conceived as kind of this combination of the, the drama of the a combination of drama and narrativization and also lots of figurization. So figures figures were kind of the peak of like this Catholic hierarchy of, of, of representation because they were God's form. So when you can paint God's form, you, you get close to that. And then when you take a lot of those God's forms and put them into a grand story, then that's even that's even something of a greater, even, even greater value. So that's what history, early historia was about, is about kind of that narrativization and creation of stories. But... So historian Mark Phillips points out, though, that these early historia was, though though we, we think of it as detached from history, um, they, these these paintings were still drawing from and explaining Europe's origins, like a, like that Renaissance Europe, its origins and its identity to itself, because they were drawing heavily from um, images from the Bible, allegories, myth, a Greco-Roman past. So the, all of the subject matter and the things that were deemed worthy of historia were things that. Um, could explain or were kind of part of that canonical history of what uh, Western Europe wanted uh, to view itself and how it wanted to craft its own identity or how it did craft its identity. Um, and I think what that reveals is that kind of, uh, I, I want to get, at, I'm starting to get at a continuity between Historia and history is that the, like painting is really, the, 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 this, this work is really preoccupied with explaining um, the past, organizing a past, the past of a civilization, past of a, like a collective population, and explaining its identity to itself. I think that's what history does, and I'll get into some um, how how that might be supported in in uh, a later history. But um, I also want to point out another level of continuity is that this early early historia um, is also elevated as the as the cap of academic painting. So elevation and grandeur. Uh, are also kind of core to this primordial history painting. Um, and then as we go to a more formalized, mature history painting in the, you know, between the 17th and 19th century, this one's in the 18th century, um, 
then we see that you know academic painting has still claimed history painting at the at the cap of uh, genre uh, the, the, the top genre in painting. Um, and to pick up another thread on the continuity, so now Phillips points out that history painting um, at this time the uh, this like in, in Western Europe between the 17th and 19th century, it was the state Western Western European states were being becoming increasingly um, secularized, kind of rationalized, um, and so in turn with that they they started to shed their identities with, well, not completely, but at least in history painting, um, there was a shedding of the uh, attachment to biblical stories and representations of myth and um, allegory. So these were becoming, these were falling a little bit out of fashion as time went on into the uh, 17th, 18th, 18th, 19th century, at, at, at this in turn with the increasing secularization and rationalization of the state. And I think what that implies is that, so history painting is still doing a lot of the same work that Historia was doing, but in relation to it, in relation to a, a, a secularized state, um, you know, appeals to myth no longer had as much purchase as they had. So, you know, a secularized state, in order to explain, in, in order to claim that identity or to, um, in order to, it, its identity was increasingly interested on historical past or, or historical fact, past fact. And so that's why history painting was increasingly interested in past facts and representing those uh, in uh, the work and shedding its kind of allegorical past. Um, so, and I just want to use that just to point out that, yeah, so history painting, um, there's kind of a continuity where it, history is not necessarily tied to representing past fact, but it's about kind of narrativizing the past, explaining it, organizing it as a way to provide an identity to a civilization and to explain its identity to itself. Um, okay, um, and then moving on here. So first, um, I want to point out here uh, um, that fact and that, that interest in historical fact was also kind of a flashpoint in the uh, history, in, in the history of history painting. Um, especially this one, so I want to use Benjamin West here, the death of General Wolf is sort of a uh, example. Um, because even though history painting was moving closer to historical fact, there was still a sort of tension between historical fact and uh, elevation in the grandeur that history painting wanted to, wanted to be, or it, it was so core to its conceptualization. Um, and so factuality um, was sort of identified with familiarity. Um, and familiarity is then in opposition to elevation and grandeur. So something that's very familiar can't also be grand and elevated. Um, and so that's why, especially in this painting, so the, 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 the uh, controversy of uh, West painting here was that these figures uh, are painted in contemporary dress. So this was an event that happened um, within living memory. Um, all the figures in this painting were uh, painted in a, in a kind of dress that was um, exactly, was contemporaneous with the time. Um, and so that was a big no for history painting uh, because it made uh, the subject too familiar and it wasn't deserving then of the same grandeur that history painting demanded. Um, but this is made up for by a different kind of distancing. So Edgar Wind, historian Edgar Wind, um, kind of conceptualizes that elevation as distance and as a matter of distancing. And that's how you produce um, elevation. That's how elevation was produced in past history paintings was like a chronological distance from the event um, and then a distance from kind of past fact also in dramatization. So I want to point out this one just real fast, uh, the allegorical uh, or the, 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 the allusion to Christ in like General Wolfe's death. So that was a different, that was a kind of distancing that has been part of history painting for a long time. Um, but distancing from like a vulgar fact, factuality that wasn't, that, that over, familiar, over, familiarized, over familiarized the subject. Um, and, but the, but the thing that made, made West painting here so revolutionary for the time was that um, he proposed a different kind of distancing. So instead of chronological distance, he said, okay, well, what about like geographic distance? Can that still get the same kind of, uh, uh, can that can it still bestow the same kind of, of, of uh, 
grandeur to the painting or the elevation that it needs to be. And it turns out it was because this was accepted into the canon of, history, of academic history painting. Um, and that argument for uh, geographical distance was accepted. So, in, you know, this is a painting of an event um, in Canada, uh, uh, Britain's conquest in Canada, and um, uh, into a, a, a Eurocentric like history painting or ac ac academy at the time, then this was a very dist uh, di geographically distant place. Um, and that distance was acceptable uh, for defining it as history painting. And so the point of that argument, that little detour was to just show how distance and distancing can create the elevation that is necessary to um, history painting's identity. Um, and you know that, that's, that's been achieved through you know, here, both through allegorical or drama uh, narrative distance, and also through uh, like the, the allusion to uh, uh, Christ there, and, and then through geographic distance. Um, and then the other, and then so now I want to point out. Um, Okay, so okay, so so now getting to how history history painting can be an expanded category and how it's been loose enough to fit Graham Moses potentially and how it did fit Horace Pippin, um, I want to describe kind of the continuity that that has underlaid historia through history painting and that could to continue now that also kind of brought Pippin into the fold. And it's kind of this interest one in narrativization. And narrativization is a way to organize um, a collective past. Uh, Explain the civilization to itself. Um, so Piven did that as well in both his paintings of Abraham Lincoln and John Brown. He made a claim uh, to kind of a, the, the, the cultural remembrance of those figures and how they would be interpreted in the uh, broader society. And same thing too with his history, with his paintings of World War One. Um, so uh, author Stephen Trout points out that um, World War One in, in the twenties and thirties was a fairly fraught. It was actually fraught in the memories of, of many Americans, so like it wasn't. A determined memory. So Horace Pippin's um, paintings of his memories of that event, uh, they served a purpose in arguing for and concretizing um, America's collective memory of, of its role and what World War I meant to uh, the United States. Um, and he kind of aligned with the, the modernist view, which uh, emphasized futility and the mechanization of death and uh, uh, the, the, the war wasn't really a place of valor, so that's reflected in his flattened figures and the really somber atmosphere. Flattened figures, flattened spaces, um, flattened uh, people. So, so that's that's the narrative, and that's that's the narrative strain, and that's the um, the uh, the narrative strain that, that makes history painting uh, uh, a continuity. And then the other one is elevation, and elevation through distance. And so um, the distancing here is when well, when there's a certain sort of narrative distance, but there's also uh, other sorts of distances in West shows how distance can be kind of uh, 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 reconceptualized, uh, reconsidered to to bring out that that necessary elevation. Uh, and maybe in, in Pippin's work, it's the flattening of the figures to make make you know, iconic images that is a kind of distancing effect. Narrative is also another sort of distancing effect, especially remembering Stephen Crowell and how um, narrative suggests a determined uh, dead self in uh, uh, contrast to a living. Of the eye. Okay, so how is uh, uh, Moses a history painter? So, bring it to the end here. The uh, the so I, I want to pick up that thread before with Crowell and and uh, the time of the eye and how Moses is mapping and that kind of representing of a determined consciousness is what makes it narrative. Um, and that's a narrative sort of distance, and it, it suggests a, a narrative distance self, and that aligns it with the narrativization of history and what makes history history. Um, but so so the one missing component then is, so how is Grandma Moses then appealing to a sort of collective memory? So how is it not just her memories? How is she sort of vying for a people's or a population's memory is as far as like a narrative is to self as history is to society um, as a sort of a, 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 um, uh, analogy. So, and well, Moses, the, the, the main piece of that argument is that she composes her paintings from 
compo they're, they're composites of like popular commercial imagery. So she draws from uh, postcards and printed pieces of news. She draws from parts of kind of this popular image making and popular um, understanding of, 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 of what the world is to compose her paintings. So that's how they kind of reach for a, something outside of her own self. So they reach towards a greater popula uh, population's memories. Um, and furthermore, um, her cardinal, she also incorporated in her own memories, so they weren't always representations of her, own, of her own personal memories. They were also sort of, she incorporated accounts of other people to kind of bolster uh, her own remembrances of things. So she wasn't always purely working from her own mind. She did go out and incorporate other people's accounts. Um, and especially that's visible in some of her works, paintings of kind of folk, regional folklore, right? So this is the burning of Troy. This occurred in 1862 um, before her, uh, around the time of her birth. So she definitely wouldn't remember this. She only remembers this because of uh, printings from news and uh, of other people in her community that remember this is a uh, uh, important event. So she includes that and that's what she paints. So th then she's appealing to a broader cultural past and she's representing and narrativizing that. Um, and that's how it becomes a kind of history. Um, and the last bit I want to I, me, I want to mention here is that her the facts of her use and so how this also bolsters the elevation and grandeur of history painting. Well, one I mean there's a distancing I've described distancing effects already, but um, I also want to suggest that uh, her intentional use um, by the state by the United States uh, as propaganda uh, abroad and sort of domestically. So what that means is that she is then intentionally used by the United States to explain the ha the past of the United States. Um, to itself. So there's a, there's a really intention in that because, you know, Harry Truman, President Harry Truman, he did take her works and send them to Europe as a way to represent what the United States represents um, and what the United States looks like and kind of the, you know, the, ideology, the ideology and values of the United States to um, a post-war Europe and in contrast to the Soviet Union. Um, so it was used as a very political tool at that time. Um, I think the stamp of like state approval or state uh, uh, sanction uh, provides a certain amount of like institutional uh, elevation and grandeur to her work. Um, and the other one is the ubiquity, ubiquity of her work because uh, these were mass, her paintings were uh, mass produced as postcards and calendars and other materials. So then they, they seep into like a broader cultural memory. So they not only uh, 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 attempt to represent the, 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 in her in her in her personal working, she reaches for others' memories. But then they also, in their ubiquity, they can represent. Um, they 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 worm their way into being uh, uh, the population's memories of these events as well because they're ubiquity. Um, so everyone has. So many people have seen Moses Moses paintings in some aspect, and they kind of become identified with this pre-industrial pre pre, uh, pre industrial super war superpower uh, United States and her images sort of become identical with that with that past. Um, and so in that way, they become the representation of, of, of like the collective consciousness, the, collect, the le collective conscious understanding in the minds of some Americans of, 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 of uh, the, 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 the past. And that's and that's a history. And that's uh, and, OK. So between the narrativization and the um, elevation, um, I think those are the key points of history. And that's how Moses is a history painter.